on a uh, radio and TV station or involved in an NCAA tournament bracket. And if you'd like to take part in that, uh, just snapshot that uh, QR code. It'll take you to the link where the bracket is. And the gifts of uh, the prizes this year, four $25 gift cards to Mother Shucker's Restaurant. And the first place, you get a trophy. And uh, you know, the lovely Donna, Honest Donna, uh, her company's doing the trophy. Trophies Plus there, too. So that's all via the QR code you see right there if you want to be a part of the NCAA tournament brackets, which the play-in game started yesterday, but those don't count in the greater sense of the 64 on the bracket. Yeah, but what about Virginia last night? They got bombed. <laughs> Sorry. You said, well, I thought you were a Terps fan. You should be happy well, about I, that. Yeah, I do like Maryland Terrapins, but I but everybody since uh, Virginia won the uh, national championship a couple of so years ago, yeah. so ago, everybody kind of at least I think of them having a good solid team. Yeah, but then not, they've been early out. They've been early out, but last night they uh, they were uh, they were humiliated. Uh, something like 25, 30 points by Colorado State. Shows uh, NCAA tournament. It's anybody's game, man. Yeah, it is. Right? A lot of parity this year. I was devastated. <laughs> you didn't even know they played. <laughs> <laughs> Our uh, next guest, by the way, Delegate Adam Burkhammer. He joins us uh, via telephone. He is a, 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 uh, sorry, a Republican candidate out of the 64th. That's Lewis County. Adam, good morning. Thank you for joining us once again on the program. Yeah, hey, good morning, guys. Uh, thanks for having me again. Appreciate it. Uh, Adam joined us uh, last year, in fact, and uh, Mr. Hornby highly recommends you as an expert on the foster care crisis in West Virginia, Adam. Uh, and uh, I know you have firsthand knowledge of foster care. Can you tell our audience your history there? Yeah, so uh, uh, foster parents started in uh, 2020, and uh, we were blessed uh, to be able to adopt our first placement. And uh, so my wife and I, um, we do uh, uh, mainly babies is what we uh, have kind of specialized in fostering where we wanted to help. And uh, so our uh, little girl, we got her at the hospital and uh, she just uh, turned four a couple weeks ago. And, um, and since then, we've continued to keep our home open and continue to foster uh, from there and uh, have had uh, several uh Several other babies and uh, kids with us. Uh, uh, some have went back to their families. Others have went to other families, but uh, have just continued to stay active in it. Just want to help any way we can, want to serve our community uh, any way we can. Adam, can you tell me as a parent what it took to become approved to get into the system so that you could then become actively involved as a foster parent? So, yeah, yeah. Um, it's it it is a little I shouldn't say lengthy but uh, it, it will take a little bit of time so uh, there are some classes you have to take they want to get you prepared for what you're getting into obviously you know we're getting children that are coming out of, of abuse and neglect situations so you need to be prepared uh, for what you're getting into there dealing with that type of trauma uh, so a lot of different classes a lot of different uh, information you're going to gather there as well as uh, they're going to do a home study on your home uh, to make sure you've got room for the children. You've got uh, uh, it's a safe environment for them. Uh, I'm thinking of the the simple things like you've got to put all the safety plug-ins in your outlets and and you've got to have all your chemicals stored in a in a locked cabinet and, and some of those things just to protect any children that would come in there. And then there's some other things like uh, uh, getting a uh, a health check for for you and your children and and your spouse and everybody in the house so they're going to check you out make sure you're healthy and uh able to uh to to care for children when they come in so um the the state does a pretty good job making sure that if they're uh going to place a child in your home that it, that you're capable of of taking care of them typically in the system how long will a child be placed with foster parents well, that's a good question, and that's uh, that, that varies. Um, every case, when you get into the foster care, you're going to see it, it's it's complex in its own unique way. So, it, the shortest amount that that child can uh, stay with you prior to adoption is is six months. So, you can foster for six months and then turn right around and, and adopt uh, that that child. 
Some can be shorter. Uh, we've had uh, children in our home for just uh, you know three or four weeks while while they were transitioning maybe to a, another family member. They just needed a safe place for a little bit. Um, and then others may may last uh, two to three years, depending on the the case and and how it's uh, progressing along. Um, uh, so what they'll do is if, uh, they don't just automatically remove a parent's rights to their child. So they'll give them the opportunity to go to rehab if it's drug related or if there's an issue with their home. They'll allow them to uh, you know make repairs to their home and, and you know clean the home up and those type of things. So. Uh, the judge has discretion in that and how he wants to uh, progress the case. And uh, some can be, like I said, uh, fairly short. Some can, can be rather lengthy. And Adam, a couple of years ago when we were looking for more foster parents in the state, the subject of compensation for foster parents was brought up and that it was lacking severely in the sense that we weren't even covering the expenses of these kids with what we were reimbursing foster parents for. What is that situation now? So in, in that case, uh, I think it was about four or five years ago, I think that was a true statement. Um, so there was a lot of work done prior to, to me even coming into the legislature to get that compensation rate up. And there was even a little bit of a restructuring where now we use child placing agencies. So private business uh, helps find homes, and, and uh, essentially those resources are funneled through that private business back into the foster family. So that structure has changed a little bit. The, the finances were increased then. I will say, though, um, I think we all realize the inflation that has hit us over the last uh, you know 12 to 18 months. Um, so we probably need to reevaluate that. Um, here as we're looking forward, because it's a fixed rate. It doesn't climb with inflation. So probably starting to, to get on the low side of that again, just uh, b- because of the um, high inflation rates we've had. And what has the legislature done in this last 60-day session and with the previous split of uh, the three departments of DHHR or DHHS, I never get those letters correct, I'm sorry, uh, to help this system uh, to uh, eliminate some of the duplication of efforts, uh, the uh, the abuse in the system, and to make it more efficient. Yeah, so the so the main thing that uh, we passed this year is what we're calling a communication portal. So when you look at the complexity of all of these cases and the amount of people that are involved, when you're talking uh, child placing agency, foster family, courts, you know, court appointed counsel. Uh, the department workers, uh, necessary, uh, the, the social uh, support services. So it, it starts getting very broad, a lot of people involved. Well, what I have saw is there's a lack of communication through that. And a lot of time it isn't that it's purposeful that people aren't communicating. It's just the burden of trying to call and email and text all of these folks. So what we designed was a communication portal where essentially all of those people can communicate together. So if the department worker puts information into their system, it's going to flow into this communication portal, and then everybody in that case is going to be able to see that information, those that have the security uh, clearance to to do and see that case, so that everybody's getting real-time data, real-time information, and that information is going to to go uh, to all of those um, necessary people. I believe that, that it, it states right in the law this is uh, created to uh, remove redundancy. So um, we're going to streamline a lot of processes so that uh, we're not we're not missing this miscommunication. And uh, on the foster parent side, when you know, I'll say for me and when you talk to other foster parents, the frustration is, is we feel like we're kind of left in the dark a little bit. And but when you really dig into it, that frustration really just comes out of miscommunication. Um, a lot of times there's not um, nefarious things going on. It's just there's only so many hours in the day. I can only make so many phone calls. And so I believe that this uh, process will uh, alleviate some of that and uh, utilizing technology where we uh, are, are short on folks uh, ha- has to be a help. Bill. Yeah, good morning, Adam, uh, and thank you for what you're doing. Uh, I have a couple of questions with numbers, and I doubt if you know the specific numbers. I'm just asking the question to get a general f- frame around it, the magnitude of the problem. Uh, 
roughly what percent of the babies are in foster care? Roughly what percent of the young children and roughly what percent of teenagers are in foster care? So I can't give you exact numbers on those breakdowns. And I'm not asking for exact. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, but, but I will say, consider this in Lewis County, uh, uh, roughly around 45% of the children in our county are living outside of the home. Now that doesn't mean that they're all in foster care with a foster family. Uh, that means they're, they're living with maybe a sibling, maybe an aunt, uncle, grandparent, or maybe they are in foster care. So, uh, and I know some of the, the counties around even have higher percentage of that. So when you think nearly 50%, right around 45% of the children in my county are living outside of the home, I, I think that really shows we've got a problem. Yeah, uh, yes, we certainly do. Those are sh- shocking numbers. Uh, what about, I come back to the teenagers. I would think the teenagers would be more difficult to find foster care placement than, say, a baby. Is that fair? Yeah, I, I would I would agree with that. Um, everybody is looking for, and, and you know, kind of speak for my wife and, and myself, we're looking for the uh, uh, the baby kind of, uh, it, it's a little easier to kind of add to the family, right? You know, uh, I've got teenagers of my own now, and uh, so I know what it's like, uh, the, the attitudes and the, the problems that come with teenagers. And so I think some of the folks, if they've never been parents, are a little shy to, to jump in and say, yeah, I'll take a, a 15-year-old. And so I think um, the, the babies and the younger ones do uh, tend to find uh, placements a little easier. So if there's no placements, what happens to the teenager? So um, they've got group homes, um, various stages of group homes um, where, where you may, might house uh, and we're not talking about the, the term orphanage. You know, we're not going to use that, and we're not thinking of that um, uh, in a sense. But a, a more of a home setting. But it's uh, you know maybe four or five teenagers living there together with some staff. Um, a little less of a family environment for sure, but but not uh, institutionalized. Um, so uh, that, but again, that's still a problem. You know, we want. We want all children, young and old, uh, to be in a family environment. Uh, I know for me, uh, family is the foundation of our society and of our communities. So when children don't have that, um, it, it leads into to a lot of other uh, issues. Mr. Gilstrap, uh, and, and like Bill, I've, I, what you're doing, I, I think, is a marvelous thing. So thank you for that. Walk me through the process of um, when in in a forceful removal of whether it's a baby or or an adolescent or whatever where mom and dad are arrested however how whatever initiates this event and the child is taken by social services or by the police or whatever separated from from the family then what i mean like right at time 0 what is the process yep so cps begins a uh, a search to a, to a matching family, and a lot of times what they want to do is try to keep that family, or sorry, keep that child somewhat in the same environment it's used to. So if they can find a, a family in the same school district, um, you know, living in the same community, they, they will. And uh, so they'll start with what they call kinship. So they want to find a relative in, in, in the area that can take the child. Uh, we move on from that relative to what we call fictive kin, which is maybe a school teacher, a coach, a neighbor. Um, so it's not blood relative, but it's still um, they're familiar with the child. And then we move into the foster uh, family uh, search. So we, we kind of step through those three things pretty quick, trying to you know get a, a child in a family. And sometimes they'll be short term. So. Uh, you might uh, find a foster family that will say, hey, can you take this child for this week while I look for family, look for kinship? So w- we go through that search process, and then we place the child there. And where is the then child while to, this search is going on? Uh, normally they will just remove the child from the home and a lot of times uh, come to the uh, local uh, DHHR um, facility. They They've got a kind of a waiting area and a play area kind of set up so that they can get them out of the abuse and neglect environment to a safe environment while they're working through this process. And then if it turns out that that 
Uncle Charlie or you know whoever is the 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 relative says sure I will take them in D- is that relative does that relative go through the same kind of background check and and facility check that that a regular foster family would go through to make sure that it's a safe place and and that sort of thing yes yeah so um, they'll do some short term work so you're kind of you know you're spot on we're going to do a background check we're going to we're going to check the home make sure they're safe really really on a on a quick quicker basis and, and get the child placed there then after that in the the family uh, kinship side then they go through more of a certification process like the foster family so the foster family does everything on the front end the kinship family does everything kind of post placement to kind of get them up to speed um on uh on, on what they're getting into. Adam, the drug ep- epidemic in uh, West Virginia and our neighboring states have placed a severe uh, pressure point, a pressure on the family and family structures, and there's probably a lot more children that needed foster care. Has the flip side, has the other side of the equation, the individuals that were willing to take in a foster care uh, child, has that increased proportionally? I'm, I'm going to say no. Um, uh, the drug epidemic seems to, to not be slowing down, and uh, the, the foster families are, are not keeping up uh, with that. Um, and um, so there, there's definitely some, some work that needs to be done there. And, and I, I'll say that really kind of across the board. I tell everybody, we need people. So the, the CPS, the department, uh, they're short-staffed. Uh, now, Commissioner Jeff Pack's been doing a good job uh, lately. Uh, his uh, recruitment retention plan that he's put forth has been bringing fruit to the table, and uh, and his vacancy rate is dropping. So we're we're doing a really good job there. The uh, we don't have enough support services, counselors, um, you know, those type of folks in the communities that, that can help deal with this trauma, deal with with children. Um, it, it's not not in our communities either. We don't have enough court appointed counsel. So those are called guardian ad litems. Um, you know, roughly about six thousand kids in care in the state of West Virginia. Uh, we have 159 uh, individuals that are practicing guardian ad litem work that are representing these children in court. Uh, and then we do go to the foster families, but we just don't have enough families and enough homes that uh, that are open for it. So. Uh, we, we've got a manpower crisis from from CPS all the way through the process. Rob had asked a question earlier about the uh, appropriation from the legislators toward toward this issue. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, uh, press, and I think uh, at, uh, appropriately so, the state's desire to keep a balanced budget uh, uh, or to a, 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 a flat flatline budget is this coming back to bite the foster care portion of our community i think it's it's starting to um i i would agree i i want to be fiscally conservative uh in in everything that we do and there's obviously i think we could all set and say there's there's wasteful spending probably on the state level as well as the federal level and uh you know there there isn't one of us that, that thinks we're not paying enough taxes right we're we all feel like we're we're, we're overtaxed, um, but we do need to, to prioritize how we're spending that tax money, and uh, and I believe that our children uh, should be at the top of that list, and uh, so we we've really got to capitalize on taking care of our kids. Uh, that's our next generation of our communities, you know, our society, our country, and so we we really got to make sure that we're uh, we're putting that at the top of a priority. Um, and um, and there's probably some maybe some other programs. I'm not saying raise taxes by any means, but there's there's probably some programs out there that could be cut to ensure that we're getting these children and their families the, the resources they need. And uh, and I think that the the key to um, fighting the foster care crisis is, and, and I'll say for me, my focus has been on the back end a lot as a foster parent. I want to fix everything from the foster parent side, but but really the key to fixing this entire problem is, and, and you, you've already alluded to it, is, is fighting the substance abuse uh, crisis that we've got going on. This epidemic 
it, it's flooding our societies, our children, our, our schools. Uh, everything that we're doing is impacted by that. And so we got to make sure we've got the adequate funding and resources on the front end of things to, to fight the drug epidemic, to give families the resources they need uh, prior to there ever being a CPS issue, abuse and neglect issue, and uh, and not just kind of trying to put the Band-Aid on it um, on, on the downstream side. Delegate Adam Burkham, we're our guest here on the program. If you're just tuning in and wondering who that voice belongs to, go ahead, John. <clears throat> Probably 15 or 20 years ago, I did a lot of research on, on this issue for a book I was doing. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and I found that one of the barriers to entry for um, parents who, for whatever reason, wanted to get into uh, the foster, uh, uh, foster care or adoption, one of the barriers to entry was at that time, uh, there was a, a rash of judgments from judges that were, were reestablishing uh, biological parents' parental rights five, six, seven years after uh, the foster parents had uh, taken charge of, of the children. And the, the biological parents had either gotten straight or sober or whatever it was. And these parents who had obviously uh, bonded with, with their child then had to give it up. I don't know if you remember those cases or not. Is that still a problem with, within the system? Not to that length. Um, I, I, would, I don't have the stats in front of me, but you're probably looking at nothing is really going to run beyond that three-year mark. And I think the stats would even say probably like the two-year mark. So I think everybody's understanding that, that, that we need to get to permanency for these children uh, one way or another. Number one is we want to work with their family, want to work with their mom and dad. And, and it, it, is, it is proven, and I believe it, that that is the best place for that child if it's safe. If it's safe, if it's healthy, let's, let's work to, to, to keep the family together. Um, and if that is not going to happen, you're, you're going to know that within you know 12 months, 18 months, 24 months. And I think that's where the judges are, are finally kind of drawing the line in that and saying, you know, here's here's kind of the backstop with it. And uh, we're going to give you a couple chances here. And uh, if it's not going to straighten up, we're going to get this child in a safe environment where they can prosper uh, from here on out. So uh, the, the long term stuff, I don't think is an issue anymore. Adam, we have a minute left. Is there anything else you can tell our, our audience about the legislature's approach to children in this state who are in need of help? So uh, complex issue. So I thought I could look at it and say, OK, there's going to be three fixes and I'm going to fix this whole crisis. And uh, it, 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 it's just not going to work that way. So complex issue, a lot of folks involved. And uh, and so we're taking it one bite at a time here, and uh, we're, we're kind of diving into the details on every aspect of it. And if anybody's got any thoughts or ideas that they'd like to, uh, to share with me on their respective role in it, uh, please look me up on the legislative website. Shoot me an email. Love to discuss with you because uh, it's going to take us all to, uh, to, to fight this. Are you optimistic about solving the problem? Um, I'm, I'm always optimistic, always willing to fight, always looking for a solution. So uh, always optimistic that we can uh, take care of our kids. And I'll say uh, we need to be optimistic. These are these are children. And I think we have a role and a duty as a society to ensure their safety and make sure they're uh, we're giving them the best chance to, to be a, a prosperous American. Adam, thank you so much for your time this morning. Greatly appreciate it. Nicely done. OK, thanks, guys. You bet. Delegate Adam Burkhammer out of the 64th at uh, 9 o'clock.